not only is this man getting out of prison after unaliving his girlfriend, people still don't think this nice guy did it. So I wanna, this is part two. Go back and watch part one about the way he treated his ex. And you know, some of, there's so much evidence that this man was a nightmare to date. And honestly, it sounds like a nightmare just to be around. I'm gonna go into that in a minute. But I also wanna hold a lot of journalists accountable for this. It's usually men, by the way, who are just like, oh my God, yay, Oscar. Although women do it too. They painted this guy as a nice guy and they even admit now that they were part of the problem. So let's get into it. I'm gonna pick up where I left off about how his ex said he was such an insecure man. He called her constantly. He even called her parents to try to be like, where is she? And you know, y'all, so this is some more red flags to look out for. She had to sh send him photos of her. Look, I'm, look at me in my pajamas. I'm not out. Look, I'm watching TV, sitting with my brother. I did that. I did that. You know, I was so, I, don't, I almost said dumb. That's, that's my own um, internal voices being really mean to myself. I knew it was messed up. But when I was on family vacation and my ex was accusing me of cheating on him, which is probably when he started cheating because as soon as they started accusing me of this crap, this is actually when they're doing it, by the way. I never cheated on him, but he cheated on me with multiple people. He wanted proof. And so he convinced me to put a tracking device on my phone. And I remember being like, I didn't tell my friend because I was like, if I tell her this, she's gonna think I'm nuts. And so that's when I started keeping secrets. Whenever you start not telling your friends what your boyfriends are, are having you do or convincing you to do so they don't, you know, have to worry. Y'all, that is a red flag within you. If you're already keep withholding information from people who will be like, that's messed up, that is a sign that that's exactly when you should be telling your friends what this person is doing. But look, he's a very insecure man. He call at all hours. I was scared of him at times because he had a very bad anger issues. He was so possessive and he would look through my phone. Men who insist on looking through your phone are also probably, there's some coercive control going on there. You know, like me, that, like their jealousy is never a, an excuse to look through your phone. That's a them problem, right? I'm not saying women don't look through men's phones, but a lot of times we don't look through their phones because we're like, well, that seems like crazy. And then when we do, that's when we find out they're like, have a secret family. Anyway, look, he never allowed me to wear makeup. Like, he, look, he, he did all this to police what she wore. Remember I talked about this in Love is Blind? I talk about this all the time. They're trying to tell you, oh, you look better without makeup or maybe you should wear this or that. You know what? Their opinion doesn't matter. It's not about the makeup. It's about control. It's always, everything that they do is about control with these kind of men. He would also like basically trick her into not wearing makeup. If we were going out, he'd just give me a few minutes so that I would not have time to get ready. He didn't want, you know, he didn't want her dressing up because he didn't want other men looking at her, which is a him problem, not a her problem. But this is what we do, y'all. We keep adapting. We keep adapting to their demands and they keep moving the goalposts. First it's the makeup, then it's the outfits, then it's the like, why are you talking to him? Then it's like literally everything. And they're never gonna be satisfied. The more you give in to their demands, the worse it's gonna get, not better. He also carried a pew pew with him all the time. Like, bro, well, there's no need for this. Anyway, she also struggled to keep up with his rapidly uh, changing personality. That switch up, y'all. Dr. Jekyll Hyde thing going on. Nice guy in public, nightmare behind doors. Switching from sweet and charming to sobbing and schmooicidal. Like I said in that last video, if they're constantly talking about wanting to unalive themselves, they will actually never do it, usually. I don't wanna say never, but men threatening this, it is a control tactic. If they ever do it, they're gonna do it with you and your children, but they usually don't do it alone. So you should be scared of them um, unaliving themselves because you're going down with them. But they're not, don't do it to save them. Call mental health people, get them help, but get away. This, this does not end well. I mean, her whole family joked about how he was like to changing personality all the time. This is all, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, this is also one of their control tactics to keep you on your toes. They, they weaponize their moods to control you. If you're in a constant state of like, how's he doing today? And you have a thermometer up his butt all the time. That's intentional. It's not because he's just emotionally dysregulated and can't control. No, because he does not do this with his coworkers usually. Or he, if he does, it is very specific who he does this in front of.
It's not because he just can't control himself, I promise. So I've been pulling from a lot of different articles, The Guardian and, and then this one. And one of the most interesting and tragic things about Reva, the woman that Oscar unalived in the bathroom as she was cowering and hiding from him, shot her four times. She had been in an abusive relationship before. And like a lot of, I don't, I'm not gonna diagnose her with chronic codependency. I will speak for myself. But a lot of codependents oftentimes want to save everyone and protect everyone because of their own abuse. But the thing is, is a lot of times the people we try to protect are abusers. And a lot of times they're actually the ones abusing us. And yet we want to protect everyone else from abusers. So her friend also talked about how Oscar was a deeply insecure man about his disability, but pro like projected this superhuman persona onto the world and seemed to be like overcompensating for his insecurities. Now, as somebody who is not have a disability, I mean, whatever, like I have like neurodivergence and narcolepsy and like other stuff, but not like, not one that affects my life like this. Not yet, as we know, able-bodied people, we tend to forget that at any moment we will be disabled. It's just a matter of time. But anyway, it sounds as if a lot of his friends, his friends and the friends of his girlfriends were like, this man was like one person to the world, you know, like, whoa, look at me. And deeply insecure and, and terrifying behind closed doors, especially with women, right? People he had power over. Speaking of which, and like I talked about a little bit in my last video, he absolutely used racism to try to get away with unaliving his girlfriend. And there's a lot of articles out there that talk about this. They talk about how white South Africans are often obsessed with home security. And part of Oscar's defense was that he thought it was some alleged burglar. And we know exactly what race he's talking about. This is rooted in anti-blackness, right? This is South Africa after, after all, right? And he's trying to play on the sympathy and, you know, white supremacy culture of anyone in the court might be like, yeah, I know what it's like to be afraid of a burglar, right? Like he's like, this is all coded. Okay. And the reason why I can speak, I have not lived in South Africa. I do. I don't want to speak about South Africa, but as a white woman from the South, this is all very familiar. This is what white people have been doing for ages, not just in South Africa and the U.S. We're still doing it. So I may be missing some things. Again, I'm not from South Africa. I don't know enough about the history, but I do know that the United States and South Africa have a lot in common. And as we are seeing right now with an apartheid state, the United States is backing. So white people use um, fear of, you know, oh, threaten, right? White women do this. Karen, this is where Karens come from. This is Karens use this tactic all the time. White women, this is, this is, you know, we do this. But Oscar did this too. He lived in like a, a fancy suburban whatever, like a fortress, to high walls, barbed wire kind of thing, 24 hour guard. This is all a really great article. You can just go and read it for yourself. But basically this journalist right here was talking about the way, you know, Oscar was using all these like very coded language, these racial implications in his defense. Basically saying, you know, there was three people, Oscar, his girlfriend, and the imaginary intruder that he has built into his fence, um, someone who is implicitly black. Is this threatening body, a nameless and faceless man um, an armed and dangerous black intruder. That's what he's, that's what he used as his defense. This is like, th there's so many things happening in this case. And yet it's funny because his whole testimony was about how he, he unalived her because he thought she was an intruder. And yet there's tons of testimonies from neighbors who heard screaming and fighting before the shots. He claims that he didn't, she was asleep and he didn't know. And then at the pill, like it's ridiculous. His whole case is so ridiculous. So the fact that anybody is even questioning whether this man is guilty is <laughs> And as is pointed out in this article, his whole defense implies that the justice system care, should care more about protecting men from imaginary intruders than women from domestic violence. How did it even get to this point where we would believe such a ridiculous defense? This deep dive in he here for, it goes into so much, but it talks about how the media built this, like this hero, this nice guy, and they overlooked all of the warnings of other people they'd interviewed, which surprises nobody, but still. In this article, they talk about some of the language that they use. I just want y'all to see all this. The way that white people use grape and protecting white women to justify heinous crime. And how, look at how they're talking about it. So here's this kid who hasn't got legs and he's trying to protect this girl. Like, 
a kid who is known for bringing pew pews to restaurants and it almost getting someone unalive. God, I'm running out of time. Like for part three.